surf beach sideways in the street. Pretty desperate situation. It's very, very tense now. Oh. Wow. The Islamic militants are fighting back. So this is a pretty big and organised hit. I'm Stuart Ramsey in the Amazon. And I'm Alex Crawford in South Africa. And this is Hotspots. Tonight, in this special edition of Hotspots, our teams witness environmental catastrophes on two continents with worldwide repercussions. We join the rangers in South Africa fighting for the future of the precious rhino. These magnificent creatures are now on the brink of extinction. And we travel deep into the Amazon, where deforestation has reached a new level of devastation. By definition, the Amazon's being attacked this is the magnificent Kruger Park in South Africa, one of the few places in the world where rhinos can still roam freely, but they are under attack. My team and I joined some of the rangers involved in the anti-poaching front line and met some of the heroes in the rhino wars. A warning that some of the viewers may find some of our pictures in our report upsetting. A rhino with a horn is a dead rhino. This is a sight that may disappear in the years to come. They felt this was a war. They had to tackle it like one, and they had to win it. You see the sheer size of them. This big, dominant horn that looks terrifying. They look like they're the only ones that could have survived some sort of nuclear war, some major wipeout. Unbelievably strong, powerful, dangerous. It's an incredible animal. When I first saw a rhino, I was in awe of their size and their prehistoric look. It doesn't seem like it fits in our world. The fact that it survived this long is amazing. It also has this kind of real depth of resonance because it is so endangered and because there are people who actually want to kill it for bits of its body. incredible animal that is just being decimated off this earth. The absolutely criminal reason why they're being killed to the brink of extinction is because of their horn. A thing that is actually the same as our fingernails, that's just keratin. It's not even nutritious. The demand for rhino horn in the Far East is massive. People will pay millions for this. On the black market, a rhino horn could fetch $60,000, maybe more. In some countries, ingesting a rhino horn is seen as an aphrodisiac or is seen as something that could give you energy all of which is absolute nonsense. Over recent years, the demand for rhino horn has gone up dramatically and poaching has gone up hugely. The time that we were in South Africa, a rhino was being killed every eight hours. Now think of that. Every eight hours, one of these animals is being slaughtered. And there was a lot of demand from the public to do something about it. In this front line to save the rhino, there are some incredible characters, amazing heroes and heroines, who go that extra mile to try and save the animal. And one of the most interesting, most charismatic, bravest individuals was this vet called William Fold who had helped save the life of a young female. 
that poachers had left for dead, having chopped off a large part of her face to get her horns. The injuries that are inflicted on these animals are crazy. Coming across these animals, barely alive, but still their ears twitching and still breathing. You need to tell the world what these animals are going through. To him, it represented the most extreme form of cruelty, that these people can come and take a machete to a defenseless animal and then just leave them, not even put them out of their misery. They managed to save one, it was a female. Beyond all odds, the rhino had survived. And they called her Tandy, which is Cosa for love. And she became a symbol of, I think, of what one man essentially could do. The Tandy's alive is, is nothing short of a miracle. She lost an enormous amount of blood. I would estimate over 20 liters of blood went into that soil around where she was lying. Now, to come across an animal as majestic as a rhino, when you find them with their faces mutilated the way she was, he had, as part of his job, to go and check on some other rhinos. The vet needs to get in a helicopter to dart a rhino. He has to get the right amount of anesthetic put into the dart. Too much will kill it, too little, and it won't fall asleep. The clock would start, and there'd be a certain amount of time to watch this animal weaving around as it slowly got more drugged, would it try and find a bush to hide under, and then bang, it would be out, and they would have to land quickly, <laughs> coordinate with their teams on the ground, who would be rushing in because they didn't want the animal to be tranquilized for so long. Okay, let's try and roll it, please. Two, three, two. They have to be incredibly careful. We're drilling the horn to put a microchip in and extract some horn tissue for DNA sampling. And if you didn't do this work, what are the consequences for? a creature like this. And unless we get these poaching statistics to come down, we could lose these animals. Alex got involved with the process of helping treat the rhino. And what is this? So this is painkillers, it's going to and okay. anti-inflammatory. Okay. I don't mind giving that. They were giving them antibiotics. To hold it as if you hold it, like you're really going to slam into it. Like a... Go like that, because if you don't, it's not going to go in. Anywhere in a muzzle, so just... Yeah. So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to try yeah. and do it like this. Give it a really good whack. Oh my god, it's a lot tougher than you think it's going to be. And then just push, yeah? Okay. Let's just get it over with then. Yeah. Perfect, good job. I can confirm that um, a rhino skin is bloody thick. Okay, we need to go. We're getting to the crucial part of the operation now, where they're going to try and wake the rhino up. So we're all having to move back out of the way for a bit. As soon as it wakes, it's not going to be friendly. We don't want to be anywhere near it. We had to leave pretty sharpish. We need to go. And when the rhino woke up... <laughs> something so wonderful. Kruger National Park is an enormous park on the eastern edge of South Africa. A stunning, stunning, stunning place. Well, this national park is the size of Wales. It's absolutely vast, and much of it is uninhabited by humans. This is what the job's all about. I mean, how good is that when you can just be interrupted by a couple of elephants? I've been up in a helicopter, and it's as far as I can see, you just see bush. It is enormous. 
poachers have carte blanche. They can just come to the Kruger and kill that rhino. That's what fire's standing by. The only way to deal with that is to throw an army at them. Roger, copy that. The poachers are well armed, not only to kill the rhino, but to fight any security forces. Shot fired. We were invited to witness a demonstration of Ranger's tactics. There is quite a heightened sense of anxiety. You really do get the impression these guys are going into battle. They're all heavily armed. They've got their trained dog with them. You can see so much more of the Kruger. And we had the privilege to see herds of rhino. Just another day at the office. That flies, right? Stunning. <laughs> it was an amazing experience to have that access, seeing places that very, very few people have ever seen. Spectacular. It is beautiful, right? The thing is, you're seeing them in their very natural habitat. And so they're running free. This is what it's all about, and they look absolutely magnificent. These are the creatures they're trying to protect. This is what motivates these people to come out here 24 hours a day. It gives them some sort of ability to try and track these poachers. They have so few rangers that it's almost impossible to protect the animals. Well, that could be a scout. And if he sees a rhino, he'll pick up his phone and call the poacher. And that poacher will come and then shoot the rhino. They felt this was a war, and they had to tackle it like one, and they had to win it. Foot patrol is a totally different experience. You're thinking, am I going to stumble across a lion, leopard? You feel very, very vulnerable. And they are understandably a bit edgy. This is not easy. The terrain is very hard. It's extremely hot. And in the park at the moment, there are something like 15 poaching groups operating. They know that. In the back of the mind, you think there's a poacher right there with his gun sights lined up potentially on you. It looks like a war. It is a war. They will shoot at us, make no mistake. So it, it really is a war of attrition between the rangers and the poachers. It really did feel a little bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. And the haystack is huge. They'll go tracking, take weapons, and they'll use animals. Yama! Yama! Come on! Come on! Come on! Dogs will be trained to attack poachers. If we catch you, you're going to jail for a long time. We're now going to um, have a little bit of time with the, the dog training, the K9 unit. They took us out on a training session. We're going along with the dog training group. Uh, I'm going to follow and see some of their methods and how they're trained to track down the poachers. One of the rangers is pretending to be a poacher. <laughs> and when they unleash those dogs, they are vicious. And they were really, really aggressive, these dogs. More aggressive than I expected. You're thinking, oh my word, I'm, I'm filming this and I'm not too far away from these guys. <laughs> Well, Garn trying to persuade me to put on the, the, the suit that protects you. I thought that it was looked foolhardy to me. <laughs> We've been told that uh, they have found a poached rhino, so we're just following the crime investigation that is going to look, search the whole area for clues so that they can eventually track whoever killed this animal. I don't think we were quite prepared for what we experienced when we went out with the CSI Ranger unit. Sad, sad sight. 
you couldn't see the rhino for the vultures. The unit is made up of specialist, experienced investigators and forensic experts. It is utterly horrific. You have this magnificent, huge creature in a pool of its own blood. It's a horrible sight. It was overwhelming because the carcass had been decomposing for a couple of days, and the sight was heart-rending. Gosh, the smell going, hey? Yeah. Jeez. Oh, it's overwhelming. Yeah. You would expect to find them on a murder scene of a human being. Here they are at a scene of a rhino killing. And they're trying to find something that will lead them to the killer or killers. So Garwin put a point of view camera on the lead investigator. I want the audience to experience what our subjects are seeing. And I think the point of view camera gives you that. We could really get a sense of what his job is and his focus is and what he sees. I wanted our audience to be the eyes of the CSI investigator. And they were very focused on finding the bullet. If they find the bullet, they can then match that bullet to the weapon that fired it. Then you've got them. Everyone gets very squeamish about blood and disintegration, animals, death. Everywhere you filmed, you had to do it in a way that wasn't going to actually show full on the gore and the horror of the scene. You want to give that impact. This is terrible what is happening to the rhinos. So you don't want to desensitize it too much, but I also don't want to put people off. So it's a really delicate balance. We should not be the filter and stop people from seeing what is real. This is what happens. This is life or death. You have a look at it and you make your mind up. The word rhino is actually derived from the Greek word for horn. That is what it is. Some of the parks are so concerned about the poaching that they are willing to actually dehorn the rhinos themselves in a desperate attempt to stop poachers wanting to then kill the rhino. The dehorning is a little controversial because obviously you are completely altering the animal. You're giving it major surgery. Is it actually working doing this? I mean, it's very it's drastic. A, it is, is it actually? That, that yeah. is a deterrence. So to take the horn off, lots of people feel that's um, giving in to the poaching in some ways. The other counter-argument is this is the only thing that's going to stop the animal being killed. Move it over. The rhino doesn't always land in the perfect position, in the perfect place. Everybody then has to try and move the rhino as best they can. One, two, three. Go, 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 go. Don't stop, don't stop. Right. Jose, Jose. They cover the eyes so that it's not too scared. And then they take a massive chainsaw. Of course, it can't feel a thing, but all you're seeing is this big chainsaw just cutting off this magnificent creature's magnificent horn. Being so close to a rhino that you can hear it breathing, you can smell it, was absolutely amazing. I was in awe of this beautiful creature. Everybody just please move it back. They were very keen to get the job done, not just for the safety of the rhino, but to make sure they did it and were well away by the time the rhino woke up. Please move all in one direction that you're not surrounding the rhinos. Because when the rhino gets up, it's dazed, it's confused. It is one pissed off animal. <laughs> oh, there we go. A rhino will, if it sees you, it's got very bad eyesight, but if it sees you, it will go for you. Do you want to get on here, Garn? We're just moving slightly back because the animals will revive quite quickly. And you can hear the rhino is getting up and moving around, and you're thinking, oh, no. When you've got a 2,300-kilogram animal who wakes up, <laughs> you don't want to be in the same area. I heard about this 
orphanage when I was researching the story, and it was quite a difficult place to find because they don't want to be found. And these are creatures whose mothers have been poached. They're abandoned, and they may also have been attacked. A number of these little babies arrive in a, a terrible state. Some of them have even been hacked, not for their horn, but hacked by the poacher to keep them away from them trying to hack off the horn of their mothers. I mean, baby anythings are um, quite endearing. Right. Baby rhinos, who are orphans, <laughs> are um, a whole different category. Jeez, have you seen the size of these things? There's nothing very babyish about them at that stage, except they act like babies. And they were feeding them with milk bottles. There we go. There we go. And you could hear them squealing, like they're crying for their milk. Your heart melts. It's just the cutest sound. And then when they open up their mouths to take the bottle, you just can't help yourself falling in love with these super cute things. And the place is run by this very devoted individual, Petronel. And she was, like, very, very at home with them. We'd all be cowering at the back, <laughs> next to the fences. They don't know their own strength. They don't know their own speed. And they also are unpredictable. <laughs> very, very unpredictable, because they don't have much sense in their head, and they're still so young. But when they want to play, well, I mean, you've got to watch out. <laughs> And, of course, Garwin was right in there. The babies were very interested, because they think, what is this strange thing? And they'd be pushing their nose up against the camera. We were really close to them. They didn't mind us touching them and stroking them, feeling like you had a connection with them. And they were just as curious about us as we were about them. Oh, my Lord. Wow, that's amazing. Look, he's loving it. He's closing his eyes in satisfaction. Have a look, Nick. Look, look at that eye. We got to stroke and to scratch under the chin a baby rhino, and it was just this, the eye, and it was, it was like a dog being petted. We saw Petronelle, manager of the orphanage, very happily mingling with these baby rhinos and not feeling even slightly threatened. <laughs> We were told they were going to be sort of herded up through this long sort of runway. I guess it was like taking toddlers to the playground. They knew what was happening, but we didn't. I went, hang on. They are running at full speed towards me. They're saying, Garwin, you better hurry. Garwin, Garwin, get out of the way. And I'm across the way filming Garwin. He leaves it until the very last second. They literally took the door off its hinges when they came through. <laughs> oh, my word. They are babies, but they could do some serious damage. We're like, Garwin, what are you doing? He was really playing with fire then. It was hilarious after the fact, but at the time, it was absolutely terrifying. As it stands right now, the war is being lost. Since 2007, poaching has increased by 9,000%. So let's put that into perspective. Each year was a dramatic increase in the number of rhinos being poached. But we need to change the attitudes and the mindset in the Far East before we have any chance of saving the rhino. Because right now, the poachers are winning. Right now, we're still at the stage where these magnificent creatures who have been around for centuries are now on the brink of extinction. Mm.